morning everyone. How are we feeling? Let's hear some more interesting stuff from Annie. So, what is that? Do you have some I'm going to get them thought. I mean, we're in Pony Sinibin. Um, good morning. Thank you very much for coming. I was, I was really nervous that no one was going to turn up, so I'm actually relieved. There's <laughs> quite a lot of you here, so thank you. Do you So, we began, I think, I don't know when we met. It was, I guess, a couple of months, months ago. ago yeah. um, and since then, I've been kind of working through the process of how I might present uh, this month's theme. So I began looking a little bit like Melian at sort of ancient Greek mythology and religion, at the nine muses, you know, the, the sort of inspirational goddesses of literature, art and sciences. And the idea of these ethereal women with divine beauty. Um, but it's the idea of women as the sort of embodiment of inspiration rather than people who realize creative ideas. And I thought, well, you know, that's fine. That's a lovely way to look at it. But it's not really reflective of how I see muse or inspiration or how it doesn't necessarily reflect my approach to the creative process. process. But in saying that, for me, muse is deeply tied, muse, a muse or to muse is deep, deeply tied with inspiration. Um, so that word kind of resonated with me. So what is a muse? I also looked it up. So I was like, <laughs> I'm not sure. Because my initial thought of muse is the band. Is, yeah. <laughs> I was the first band, well, I'm going to say first. My first band was actually here, say. But my second band, <laughs> my second band was muse. And I went to Newport Leisure Centre and I was 14. We all, all the girls went because the boys were going. I mean, I did like Muse, and the supporting band was 100 Reasons. So when I tell that to people, sometimes they're like, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> but anyway, so that was my initial thought. Then I looked it up. So I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking, is it to be inspired, to have vision, a sort of direction, or conviction? So in thinking about what to say, I've kind of gravitated towards the idea of inspiration as a concept, and I sort of eternal search for it. So I've been thinking about my experiences along the way and how they might have shaped my approach to, I suppose, not only my creative practice, but I mean, pretty much everything. So I suppose just a quick overview. <laughs> this is me <laughs> hanging out with the police. It's quite, <laughs> it's, it's actually quite normal. My mum's over there. So my mum's in Cord Koch and Caddy, the socialist street choir that sings every Saturday in town. And we were always on protest. So I, I couldn't tell you what this was. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and I was always in cycling shorts. And people thought my mum didn't look after me properly because I used to wear cycling shorts throughout the whole year. And I would only wear cycling shorts. <laughs> but anyway, that's a different story. <laughs> I just love it. They were, <laughs> they were blue and flowery, and I thought they were really nice. They were from Primark, so it's really nice. Um, so I grew up um, speaking Welsh and Cornish in the home. I was an Irish dancer <laughs> for, like, for 15 years. This is like exceptional. My legs were really, really tanned, and I had a wig on. It was, it was great. Um, so I was a bit of a dweeb at school. I mean, I, I did actually love school. Um, I worked pretty hard and did quite well in my exams. I studied fashion at university and didn't even look at the curriculum, but decided Liverpool was a place for me because I love the Beatles so much. Specifically Paul McCartney. I probably couldn't tell you if I love Paul McCartney more than my mum did, but that was my obsession. Um, I naturally, when you go to university, joined an R&B pop band. So this is... <laughs> This is me hiding under, like, I, I'm the one who doesn't show my belly, so I haven't done any sit-ups. This is me hiding under my sort of mop of hair. It kind of looks quite beetleish, I think. But so that, that's, so that was me. So then I moved to Brighton and London, and I thought, sure, I'll do it again. So I joined another pop band, um, this one with my sister. Um, so this was, I feel like this was kind of, th this whole period of time was sort of one chapter for me. And that all came to a head when this band disbanded and I moved back from London so I left London went home sort of with my tail between my legs with a massive debt obviously and a broken heart um, and I moved back to Cardiff and I feel like it was the first time that I'd ever I'm talking really fast I know I need to slow down it's the first time that I'd ever sort of reflected on anything because I feel like you just go 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 and so it was a time to sort of reassess what I thought I was doing so, 
So this is me. So I kind of like began sort of reassessing <laughs> my motivations and sort of my ambition and my direction. I f and I thought, I mean, I actually don't know who I am and I hadn't considered it. And it was that sort of crisis of identity that I'm sure a lot of us have had and what I quite like to refer to as my quarter life crisis. And I kind of feel like you're sort of bundled out of school, and this is what I felt like. I wonder if I can play that again. No, I, I won't try. I might mess this up. So you're sort of bundled out of school, and you're kind of a bit like Bambi on ice, and you start skating, and it's like some of us manage to learn how to slow down or manoeuvre or sort of jump over obstacles. But some of us, like me, might not notice that you're actually skating or what direction you're going until you actually crash into something. And for me, so being in a band, you kind of need uh, the sort of skating skills of like Torval and Dean to be able to manoeuvre around and be able to sustain yourself, not only sort of creatively, but also like mentally and financially, which I wasn't exceptional at doing. <coughs> and I sort of did manage for a fair while, but then that crash, like I said, came, to, came for me when the, um, the band ended. And that had been my whole identity for a lot of years, so it kind of was a bit of a, a wake-up call. So I moved home. Is I moved? Yeah, there's a, it's me. <laughs> um, so I moved home and sort of to start all over again. But when I moved home, at the time I was like, friends, I'm gonna like be here for like three months max, so you know, like make the most of me. <laughs> and I mean, that was in 2011. They're like, I mean, you're still here, so what are you doing? <laughs> So I guess my first instinct was to kind of, like I said, I had that sort of crisis of identity. I was like, who am I? So I thought, I'll start at the very beginning. So I learned a bit more about the Cornish language. Um, so I studied the history of the language and learned a bit more about my dad. It's an excellent outfit. In the meantime, so just to explain a bit further. So um, we spoke Welsh and Cornish in the home. So me and my sister spoke Welsh to my mum, and then we all spoke Cornish to my dad. Um, so to me, Cornish was a bit like, it was a language for the home, and I didn't really know many of the Cornish speakers, and if I did, I really saw them. So taking uh, some Cornish exams and joining, this is the Cornish, Gar Cornish Garcet, we have a Welsh and a Breton equivalent as well. It helped me to sort of widen my perspective of the language and the culture, and sort of help, help me to understand a part of myself that I hadn't really explored before. So around the same time, so I just moved back to Cardiff, um, and there'd been so many changes. When I'd left, there wasn't a St. David's too. I mean, to be honest, like Cardiff was pretty gross, like in the 80s and 90s. I mean, it was like brown and gray and rainy and dreary. Like the only fun thing I remember, apart from go going on protests and stuff, which is excellent, was going to Techniquest. So in the Bay, there was only Techniquest and the Maritime Museum, which were both you know, thrilling. And I don't remember anything else being in Cardiff that much. But there were a lot of things happening, like a lot of old buildings disappearing. And I felt like I didn't like it, but I didn't know why. And I wanted to understand why. And I'm sure a lot of you will join me in, in sort of stating that, like, complaining is really nice. I really like doing it. I, <laughs> I, think, I think I'm probably quite good at it as well. But I thought, I, I felt I'd reached a point that I probably should do something a little bit more practical rather than just complain, not to stop complaining, but maybe perhaps, perhaps direct my complaint towards the right people or the right persons. So I decided to go back to uni, this is me. Um, so having studied fashion, the natural progression of course was to go to study a master's in urban and regional development. It was, <laughs> um, so, I basically wanted to understand who was making decisions, why they were making decisions. So this master sort of looked at factors that influence political, economic and social changes in places. And I loved it so much. I'm now doing a PhD. So it's a sort of, it's a wider European project looking at economic and regional development in small in post-industrial towns in Wales. So that's another part of what, who I was exploring. And there's this, this one. That's her. This is the one who studied fashion. That is actually me, by the way. Um, so although I didn't pursue a career in fashion, I did a couple of interns and I, internships, and I was terrible. I was lazy. I didn't get it. I, like, I spoiled some patterns that a designer had made. So I, like, I was no good. 
But I realized, it took me a degree to realize that I actually prefer buying clothes to making them. But you know, that's fine. Um, also, like you, you can see, I like to change my hair a lot. This is my natural look. So when I say natural, I mean not pink, because I don't, I don't really know what my natural color is anymore. Well, I do, it's just I'm not accepting it yet. <laughs> so, um, and again, the other part that I was ready to explore after a, a while was music. So when I came back to Cardiff, I started a band with my school friends, and that was really fun. It was nice to be in sort of company that people that you knew and had known for a long time and who understood you, so we made some music together. And then I suppose when you're not like 15 or 16, it's quite difficult to coordinate your lives when you're all adults, you're like, should we have a band practice? They're like, oh yeah, I just, no, I'm finishing work in like half eight. And like, so it got a bit difficult practically. So I just thought, I just stopped making it by myself. And not that I thought I'll be excellent by myself. It was just like a practical thing. and It was just easier. So, so that was the music side. So I suppose exploring all these aspects were part of a long process tied into the idea of grounding myself again, because I felt like I'd been floating around for a while. But I think what this was leading up to was the search for inspiration. And up until that point, I feel like creativity to me had been about creating something that was good. So I don't know if, if, if you've experienced this, but when, you know, I'll, I'll go to an exhibition or I'll see work by you know, the classics and I look at them and I'm like, wow, that is really good or that is excellent. Like, I'm so impressed. And it's not that, that they're not good, it's just that, that that was my feelings. And I thought, that, so that would be my motivation. I want to be good at something. I'm going to be good at drawing. I'm going to be good at making music or whatever good meant, because obviously it's subjective. So, but also I think you could probably link that quite easily to like the need for approval or accolade because I'm, I'm a bit of a show off. So I obviously want people to think it's good, <laughs> but, but I, I, you know, that's just, I think that's just a given. <laughs> so it had never sort of occurred to me to question my motivations. Like I suppose the only thing I knew, and I, I probably think most of you would agree is that like the creative process is compulsive. You don't really think about why you're doing it. You just have to. Um, and even like friends would say, listen to this record or watch this film and it's the best thing ever, it's the best film that's ever been made. And you watch it and you're like, well, you know, that's, that's good. But like, I don't feel anything. So I suppose that's the point when I started thinking, maybe I'm not an artist because I don't like anything. <laughs> what is, what's wrong with me? Like, I, I, what, what am I even doing? So it wasn't until I went to visit my friend in London and she had a tape membership card and she was like, meet me in the tape, we can go to the members lounge. Just like, the members lounge, oh my God, I'm so excited. Just wanted to chill there and look like posh with my wine glass. <laughs> and she was like, oh, we have to go to this exhibition first. I was like, sure, no problem. Um, and it wasn't until I went to see Agnes Martin, the exhibition in the Tate in 2015, that I sort of realized I'd been getting it all wrong. So. I can't tell you, I mean, you can't see in this picture so much, I can't tell you why these specific set of rectangles moved me more than any other sets of rectangles that I've ever seen. But it's just that I realized that I was kind of, it's, this sounds really cheesy, but that I was sort of witnessing someone's truth. There wasn't a barrier between the artist and the work. It was fully realized and it gave me that sort of sense of calmness and, and happiness. So it was that point that I worked out that I didn't really want to make work that was good anymore. I just wanted to make work that made me feel like I did when I saw her work. And I didn't want to be like her. I didn't want to make work like her. I did, I did actually try just in case that like <laughs> rectangles was the meaning of life. <laughs> but but, but it, it wasn't for me. So I think that was the closest moment or the first moment that I realized that I'd been inspired. And that sort of has carried me ever since. So in reflecting about how this impacted on my work, I'd been sort of painting for a while. I kind of developed this style from university. And it's quite distinct, but it wasn't making me like happy anymore. I knew it was like quite 
good, you know, it's not bad, but it didn't, I didn't feel anything. So now that I knew what I was looking for, I kind of realized I'd have to change my approach. But the problem is, is that when you've been working on something for quite a while, you become quite attached to a body of work. So, and it was over a number of years as well, so it wasn't really easy to leave it behind. But equally, it was so liberating because it just opened like a whole new world. I could just go and do anything. And it was just that moment of just letting go of something that, you know, you're quite proud of, but it doesn't represent you anymore. So I sort of began taking photos around Cardiff, just documenting those changes that I was talking about. And that, I got bored of that. So I thought, what can I do? So I printed a lot of these photos. So I just started cutting them up and I kind of developed into the, some of the work you're seeing there. That's just some of them. And so, so my next idea is sort of to combine more of the painting and the collaging. So I've started a little bit, but I, I'm just developing ideas at the moment of what I want to do next. So, so what have I learned? <laughs> I've learned. <laughs> I've learned, I suppose, not to be afraid to try something new. I know that's really obvious. But like, honestly, when it's all said and done, no one actually cares. If someone's sitting on the bus scrolling through Instagram, they see a picture you've done, they're like, oh yeah, that's nice. Oh my God, have I fed the cat? Oh God, I need to book that appointment with the doctor. So no one actually cares. You might as well just do it. And genuinely, my only measure, and I tell Melon this, and I think she liked this as a motivator, your only measure for whether or not you should pursue a creative activity should be, is anyone gonna die if I do this? <laughs> <laughs> and I can like genuinely I can guarantee you that 99.9% .9 of the time your answer is probably no so in which case you should probably just do it and you should keep doing it as long as it makes you happy and if it stops making you happy try something new you can always go back and I would definitely say um, especially thinking about my experience in a band try not to focus just on one thing because I think I feel that doing more things that help me gain a perspective on the various things that I do. So at the moment, um, well, I've just finished writing and producing my first album. Um, I, I'm going to be honest, I've never produced anything in my whole life. But I thought, well, no one's going to do it for me. And also, I thought, no one's going to die. So I'm just going to do it. Um, and it's taken a long time, but it's something I'm proud of. And I think that's the sort of the best outcome you can possibly have. So. I think, like, so for, for everyone else, if there's any projects you're thinking of doing, I think just do it, because remember, no one's going to die if you do it, <laughs> unless you're that 0.01%, but, but don't be that. But, um, so, I, I think I've spoken really fast, so it's probably like 10 minutes instead of 20, so that, that's all I've got. So, dear <laughs> and thank you for listening. <laughs>